under the sun. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? Because I know you all have a lot of wonderful material to get through. Does that sound okay? Okay, cool. Thank you, everybody, for joining um, the last final session of our um, STARS virtual conference. Um, we're really excited to have Medallia here today um, to really walk us through um, the voice of the customer, I, I would say, less as a set of tactics or measures and more as a philosophy to weave throughout your entire culture. Um, and so we're, we're really happy and grateful to have them here. Um, one of the things we've talked a lot about with Medallia is um, how behind the healthcare space is in, in truly implementing the voice of the customer. Um, I know it's kind of a buzzword right now. We we have a lot of clients that are even investigating, you know, developing voice of the customer positions within their organizations. But really, as an industry, um, e even on the very high performing side of our performance distribution, we're still very much focused on surveys, right? Looking back in time at an experience that a member or even a provider has had. Um, and and just trying to measure it, um, and and in some ways teaching to the test because right that's that's what our money's tied to. That's what Stars is based on. Um, so what our Medallia partners are going to do is talk to us today a little bit more about how do we move along the continuum to a more sophisticated um, and advanced way to think about the voice of the customer, where we're not just looking at a single signal of of a survey um, for memories that happened, you know, maybe six months ago. Um, but get farther along that continuum to truly orchestrating every detail of the member experience, um, getting away from being fixated on, you know, the literal language of each CAPS measure, for instance, and thinking about the entire experience of the member and how we um, can proactively orchestrate their journey through engaging with the healthcare system, right? So as I think about um, the increasing weight of CAPS, and how we're thinking about ways where we can raise that member experience as measured by CAPS to a high level of performance and then stay there. Um, I really believe that that is not going to happen by literally focusing on every item in the CAPS survey. It's going to happen by taking kind of a global approach where you are building out a true ecosystem for your members to engage with their healthcare and thrive be satisfied, do the things that you need them to do, um, be loyal and stick around, um, and, and really build that long-term relationship with your customers. Um, so I will stop talking now and hand it over to the Medallia crew because they have put together, um, I think, some very inspirational, but also um, tactical information on, on how you incorporate voice of the customer into your organization. So with that, I'll welcome Tim Krug and is Richard on too? Yes, Richard, are you there? Hmm. Well, let, let me try to track him down. He <laughs> says he's on the call, but we don't see him. Okay. Thanks for that introduction, Nate. <laughs> well, I'll let you guys take it away, maybe, and introduce yourselves and dive into your content. I'll I'll hunt down Richard um, on the meeting. And okay. um, We'll go from there. Yeah, I can start. So my name is Tim Krug, and um, I, I work for Medallia, obviously, and Medallia is, is an experience management platform uh, that has been around for about 20 years now. And um, with me, Richard Schwartz will actually kick it off um, here. But we just want to provide some, as Nate said, some inspirational content, and then I will follow with some specific details on uh, how to actually take action on that. So he keeps pinging me, Nate, that he doesn't have the right link. Sorry, guys, let me, let me just get him this link so we can get him on. Yeah, and this is Rex, and I'll just jump in and say, uh, you know, we, many of you were on the session we had on Tuesday, which was, um, you know, dedicated to creating a culture of quality, right? And we we talked a lot about you know all the things you can do 
from a from a culture standpoint and how important that is. Um, and definitely, you know, one of those initial steps in building a culture of quality is all around um, all around the voice of the member, right? And leveraging the voice of the member. So, you know, collecting all this information and actually listening. <laughs> Josh. <laughs> I think this is a great kind of next uh, next um, next session to have right after that culture talk and with all the importance of the the member experience right um, within our organizations today, 60% of stars and um, et cetera. So excited to hear this. Everyone that's wearing plaid, go on video. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, he'll he'll be here in a second. Sorry, everybody. I'm just trying to get him on. No worries. I thought I saw Josh try to come on video. I thought he went and put a flannel shirt on. Yeah, I thought I think that there was I did. There was originally a zoom and they were on that. Uh, yeah, the original invitation was our Stars Council meeting and it was a Zoom. Josh, look at you. <laughs> and any New Englanders have plaid at, at any dro a drop of a hat. New Englanders can grab plaid. <laughs> There's Rich. <laughs> hey, Rich. Uh, I was on a Zoom call. <laughs> yeah, no, we figured we would send everybody like three different links and then like see how it worked out. Um, that's our customer experience uh, exactly. experiment for the day. <laughs> um, you missed. I gave the best uh, introduction ever to you, and so um, oh now now you're really on the spot to to deliver some brilliance. But everybody, this is Rich, uh, colleagues with Tim. So now I'll actually let you guys take it away. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, thanks. I'll I'll have to watch the replay. Um, <clears throat> Let me go ahead and share my screen and get started. The big question of the past couple of years, are you seeing my screen? You are. OK, great. And you can hear me also? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, you've already been introduced to me and we're a couple minutes behind, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is interactive, so please, if at some point um, you have a question or want to disagree or agree or anything, um, please just do chime in. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, mostly about mindsets. If I can get my slides to advance. Great. OK, so yeah, this is an article from McKinsey back in September 2022, and I know it's it's looking backwards a bit, but you know, the notion that it helps us think about is that everything works. Right, star rating contracts in 2022 outperformed the average in recent years, um, but but everything works until it doesn't. And the retroactive analysis that McKinsey did showed that these 69 contracts here would have lost an average of, of $28 per member per month, and that's about 800 million in annual revenues. And and it begs a question for me. And the question that, that it begs is if 332 were unchanged, we have to start thinking about what makes a six, what makes a seven, what makes a 10? Because if everybody's gonna get to four and fives and just a few are gonna be left behind, should we that are exceeding start to raise the bar? Um, because I believe that if you believe what you did last year, 
is going to get you the same results next year. It's probably not the future that you're hoping for. And in moments of need, the people we serve aren't looking at stars. Uh, this is kind of required watching for me. I've worked inside of patient experience um, in healthcare for uh, a number of decades, mostly on the pharmaceutical side of the business. But hi, Daniel Blake is mandatory watching for me simply because it helps us understand the view from the patient's world. And, you know, the quote from the movie that my name is Daniel Blake and I'm a man, not a dog as such. I demand my rights. I demand you treat me with respect. I am a citizen, nothing more and nothing less. And the thing about the movie when you watch it is it's a tale about a broken system where feedback goes unheard and people in need either leave except the status quo or they get crushed underneath the weight of helplessness and the weight of the system. And, you know, I venture to say that there are people that aren't giving ratings that are feeling like Daniel Blake because they just don't know how and they just don't know how to be heard. So chapter one in this, that was my prologue, is the golden rule. And you all know the definition of star ratings, right? Provide Medicare consumers and their caregivers meaningful information so that they can make you know, the right decisions uh, as active healthcare consumers. Well, you know, when, when I read that, it, it kind of makes me think that maybe, maybe these, these weren't created to validate that everything's great. I think it's a heat map and it's a heat map that tells you where you're failing and floundering and falling short of expectations. So you can take purposeful actions as starting to chase the score causes really, really bad behaviors. Looking at it as a heat map um, becomes a really interesting lens on it because it, it, in this notion, the government is incenting all of you to do well by doing good. And, and that's a gift. We don't get that um, all that often. And now this time of year, uh, if you turn on your TV or you're susceptible to robocalls on your phone, um, and some of you might be doing some advertising. I don't think any, this is any of you, but we know that Medicare is starting to scrutinize this even more and more. And when we start to lean on the attention merchants, um, that is the advertising world, some things can go wrong. And it's where um, some nefarious characters start to enter the equation because they see an opportunity to go after easy prey with seniors. And that hurts all of us. So I think we have to be very cautious about how we start to advertise. I'm glad CMS is leaning in, but it also requires all of us to police ourselves and police our industry and how we communicate. You get the behaviors you incent. If you incent an agency to get you more phone calls, you will get more phone calls, but that might not necessarily be what you want and what your customer wants and needs. And we have to think about the race we're actually in. If you look on the team's call and you look to your left and you look to your right, those people probably aren't your competitor. Your competitor are, are the experience for the, the expectations for better experiences. Your competitor is bad experiences. Your competitor is broken experiences. So to get out of the snail race, we have to look in the mirror really carefully. We have to look at the industry very specifically. Um, I like to talk about healthcare experiences as being grounded, and I look at it on three levels, and, and the first level is the battleground. Will we compete with one another on better experiences? Yeah, we should. We should we should actually strive to outshine and raise the bar higher but this is healthcare one of us being bad at it like a hospital being bad at experience and an insurer being good at it and a pharma company being terrible um it all starts to break down so um this is a raise all boats opportunity and the events that i go to and where i speak and where i sit with industry people i am seeing more and more the notion of everybody saying how can we help each other raise the bar and it's a proving ground we all want to innovate we all want to make meaningful changes and we want to do things that are special for people you can't you can't innovate without the customer and you know you know it, you hear it inside of rare disease nothing about us without us so getting back to that notion of the golden rule you know loving customers and i'm not kidding about that word is is actually uh and creating promoters is actually an unbeatable business strategy inside of um his book winning on purpose fred reichelt 
um, the inventor of the net promoter system talks about that inside of two chapters. Because when you get a diagnosis for a chronic condition, when you turn 65, right, you suddenly have this full time job that you're going to have forever. And you're probably scared and you're probably unprepared and you're probably unqualified. So what could go wrong? Um, it's just about everything. And there's there's a not so subtle pivot on the golden rule. Um, and, and that is treat others as they would like to be treated. And that's why feedback becomes so important. That's why listening to people and understanding that really matters. Chapter two, incredible accountability with limited authority. You know, what if your customer feedback was a superpower for you when you have accountability, but not authority? Uh, and this notion of trust emerges here and we don't talk about it until it's a problem. And uh, inside of the court of public opinion also known as google uh, we're talking about it a lot uh i i've done this for years where you know google's algorithm if i start to type in some words and i don't complete the sentence and they usually end in is or are um google fills it in with what other people are searching and it doesn't change much over the years and it doesn't look good for everybody across the healthcare industry um doesn't look good for doctors often it did during the pandemic nurses nurses everybody loves, right? And Gallup polls, they're the most trusted profession. Um, and then, you know, the notion that this quote keeps coming up for me. I read this book and it, keep, it, it keeps coming back that, <clears throat> that a dog will go to a crying human b before a happy one, a smiling one, because they get sad when people around them get sad because they're created that way. It's called empathy and we have it as humans too, but it gets blocked by other things. It gets blocked by our ego and self-pity and thinking our own pain must be tended to first and dogs don't have those issues. And and why do, why do I bring this quote up? Well, <clears throat> that notion of thinking our own pain must be tended to first. What are we fixing for us? What are we hearing about us? Um, I, I wonder sometime, are we simply losing the script? Do we need to look at our customers more careful? Um, Compassion builds trust and trust builds businesses. And I won't read all of these to you. Um, this book by uh, Ashley Rockheld and Amanda Dunlap, Amelia Dunlap from uh, Deloitte is, is a great book. I read it on a flight the other day and it raises these points around being trusted companies just to help perform their peers. And trust, if you look at work by Dr. Crum, Dr. Alia Crum at Stanford, you look at Kelly Harding's uh, The Treatment Effect, you look at Compassionomics, trust actually has a whole lot of power inside of people's outcomes and you're part of the outcomes. <clears throat> I also look at, you know, the fact that I don't think anybody is buying a Medicare Advantage plan. I think what people are actually buying is a better version of themselves. Mario never wanted the flower. <clears throat> he wanted to throw fireballs. Actually, actually he, he wanted he wanted pink, but the the notion is that if we talk about the product in advertising, we have this feature, that feature, um, we lose sight of what customers actually want and need. <clears throat> and voice of the customer heard, understood, and acted upon actually is a fireball. <clears throat> so the VOC demands, you know, those with authority empower those with accountability. Maybe it's not as crazy as it seems when you can take the voice of customer to those with authority and say, this is what we're hearing and, and it's incredibly loud and it's extremely close and our customers are suffering for it and it's going to reflect on us this year and next and it's going to reflect on our industry. It is hard for people with authority not to give the people with accountability what they want because those narratives are real and they're pressing. <clears throat> One quick word of caution is when that notion of the fireball, if you start to think about it, it's yours to find, it's not yours to throw. And I always think about it like this, you know, Dorothy's the customer, not, not and you're, you're Glinda, like you're Yoda, you're the fairy godmother. And in the other case, you know, um, people told me that looked like me. So I changed that one up a bit. <clears throat> so chapter three, missing bullet holes. What really drives scores are better still promoters and and it's not even about the score is what drives sentiment what drives people to think about you as somebody they trust and care about and if you've heard this story i apologize but during world war ii 
it had become statistically impossible for a plane to make 12 flights over Europe, the Allies had realized. And, and that statistic pointed toward um, an outcome in the war that we did not want. And um, so they started to map when the planes came back where they had been hit because they knew they needed to reinforce them. They knew they needed to make more than 12 missions over Europe. And they took that data back to New York to a guy who would be called a data scientist today, a Romanian immigrant named Abraham Walden. He looked at the diagrams that they gave him hundreds of them. And he said, um, you know, this isn't what matters. These are the bullet holes that you know about. I need the missing bullet holes. And so he started to look at this in a very different way. Um, and the knowable, data changes how we see the known. These planes with the red bullet holes came back. These other ones didn't. So where we needed to reinforce was actually inside of the blue dots where those planes were never returning. And so for us, what we can get in feedback and what we can see, you know, in stars, we kind of know, you know, members who stay, we kind of know members who left. We kind of know the things and the grievances they have and the ratings they gave. But we don't always know why, and that requires voice of the customer. And to be clear, we, we are talking about people and not planes. So if we're looking at them based on what is the matter with you versus what matters to you, then, then we start to lose sight of that this is a human on the other end of the equation who needs our help and needs our support. And, and again, creating trust and being compassionate just simply drives business. And, and you know, it, if you ever get an email from me, I, I, this this quote from Doug, David Augsburger, he's an Anabaptist minister, that being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, the two are indistinguishable, is really powerful. And it tells us that, you know, let people know you listen and act. It's not just about collecting, collecting a, a rating. It is about what you do with it. I think it's actually content for you to push out to your members and say, hey, this is the feedback we got. Some of it wasn't great, but we heard you and we thought about it. And this is what we're doing about it because anything less, it's just about you. And this is a metric that that I use with, with teams that I work with and I call it TATS. It's about trusted actions taken. And these are the things that you do to demonstrate to customers that you are listening. Um, and also, if we can look at operational metrics like clicks and visits and calls and views, and they're great, but they're not scalable or repeatable unless you spend more money. Trusted actions taken become part of your organizational's customer operating system, if you will. And that kind of leads me to a conclusion. Of course, we have key performance indicators, and we should look at key performance indicators, but the other KPI in communicating internally and externally about what you're hearing and what you're doing is to keep people informed, involved, intrigued, invested. Um, and that's the most important KPI you can get as you start to listen to voice of the customer. And I'm going to pause there and I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks, Rich. I'm just curious, uh, Rex and Nate, um, First, I'll start with you. Like, what, what's your reaction to some of the um, thoughts that Rich shared? And um, I know he's trying to inspire us. Um, what's, what's your what's your reaction? Uh, my, so my gut reaction, I think, and and for folks on the call, um, us us stars leaders that that sit in these very prickly chairs all year long, where um, there is there is a very definite technical test, and that is what we are all oriented towards, right? Because it's driving our revenue, it's driving the pressure that's coming us at us from the top, it's driving the pressure that's coming up, up to us from the bottom. Um, and, and when we were talking with Rich and, and Tim about this, uh, and I kind of first saw some of these slides, my reaction was how valuable the reminder is for all of us who are involved in the strategy and tactics day to day to remember what is the actual point of STARS. It is not to make our lives hard and stressful, although it does, right? Both two, multiple things can be true at once. Um, the point is for CMS to incent us to do good. So we do well when we do good by the members for whom they are entrusting us to care for. Um, I think back to uh, a prior life where we had a CAP summit and we had 
our chief marketing officer come and kind of talk talk through the member experience. And this was this was before the voice of the customer buzzword in in a, in a healthcare. But what he got up and he said was, "It is our great privilege to be allowed to help members along their healthcare journey. That's that's how we should view it." And when we think about why is CMS shifting away from clinical outcomes and preventative care in terms of the, the system by which they incent us to do that good and moving more towards the member experience, um, yes, it is hard. Yes, we complain about it amongst ourselves. But the reason is because they understand that caring for that member, making them feel heard, you can go so far as to say making them feel loved, the loyalty and the trust that comes with that is what we're trying to combat and improve in the healthcare system so that members want to engage with the healthcare system more and and create again that ecosystem that I was talking about where a happier, more engaged, more trustful member is just more likely to engage in certain other behaviors. And so you're setting up a healthier cycle for that member that ripples out into that community. Um, so I, I think I, that's what that's my gut reaction. That's kind of a long winded way to say that. And and I know stars leaders, your time is valuable. You want to definitely get to some tactics, but I do think that it is very valuable for us to take a step back. Right. We've talked about goal setting. We've talked about um, stars 101 and what we've got to do to get the year started off. Right. We've talked about culture. And let's take a step back and think about why. Why are we doing all of this? Um, why is this so important? Um, and recenter ourselves around the fact that it's important because it is important for the the individual like people that we are serving. Um, Rex, I don't know if you have some other thoughts about that. Well, really, really well said. I, I was just going to say, um, yeah, I think where we are as a as a an industry in Medicare Advantage, especially like like I think that's probably the most important message we could have heard right now. Like it was um, the content was and I've not heard Rich speak before, but while the the content was spot on and the delivery was incredible, no nobody was going to interrupt you even if we had questions or uh, or or comments. Nobody's going to raise their hand during that because it felt like it felt like uh, just it was a really powerful presentation and with with all the right things. And I think a couple of things you said specifically, like, like shooting for six or seven stars, right? Like that's not, I mean, I think we think we're overachieving when we're shooting for five stars, most of us, I think. And I don't know that that concept has really been, you know, um, adopted in our industry of actually shooting for six. Right. And I think that just that alone, that having that thought process and that goal, embedded in our culture of overachieving is, is is great to hear and then like Nate said everything you said about trust you know I think um you know we are we all recognize how low the trust is in our industry and yet we choose to work here we choose to be the ones making a difference and and I think the bar is so low that's that you know we we, we can we can make a difference right and I think that was a really inspiring talk so yeah I, I really appreciate that Rich thank you thank you all really very much can I say one more thing, Tim, before you go in? So um, the the snail slide where, you know, look to your left and your right um, and, and your peers on this call are not your competitors. Your competitors might be bad experiences. Your competitors are actually also all the other companies that your consumer is dealing with. Um, and Tim, you might be talking about this soon. So like, yes, we are each other's competition, uh, bad experiences in the healthcare system, and um, maybe not even with the payer, right, are, are the competition. But also, please remember that, um, you know, Apple and Disney are your competition, hotels are your competition, banks are your competition. Um, and right now, consumers trust all of those things a lot more than they trust us. So with that, Tim, maybe that's a good segue into some of the stuff that you it's might be perfect. talking about. Yeah, I have a, I have a, Tough act to follow. You can see my screen, right? Yes. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to follow the follow the beard and uh, talk about experience management, maturity, um, share some specific like tactics and opportunities for change that we see across the industry in healthcare. Um, and in that context, I'll be talking about solicited, observed, connected, and orchestrated member experiences. So 
Um, I thought it would be helpful to provide some context before I talk about maturity and our thoughts about how healthcare payers stack up against other consumer brands. And uh, if you're not familiar with Medallia, we're considered an, uh, a market leader by the analyst community. These are some examples from Forrester, from Gartner, from IDC in terms of the capabilities that we have, strength of our analytics, um, the ability to drive and facilitate action, and the return on investment that, that action provides. But for me, I think it's, uh, it's our experience working with brands like this that most people would consider to be experienced leaders, right? The Apples and the Disneys, as Nate said, of the world. And this isn't an exhaustive list of our customers, but it, it provides an example of the types of brands that we have the privilege of working with that informs our opinion of what great looks like. And so with that said, when we think about experience management maturity, we typically see uh, organizations following somewhere along this maturity curve. Um, so where people start is they have a solicited strategy. They, they send surveys to folks. And then the next step typically is to try to observe what people think and feel instead of always having to ask survey questions. And then once organizations do things like that, they start moving into thinking about things in more of a connected way, doing things like uh, journey analytics uh, or focusing on this omni-channel view of experience management and with, with an intent to be able to orchestrate, to be able to actually change the experience that people are having um, in the moment, right, uh, with their brand. And so when we think about where do most, most healthcare payers sit that we've had the opportunity to, to talk with, um, they're typically in this, this area versus the organizations that you would probably consider to be an experienced leader, they're really pushing the needle on orchestrating, personalizing experiences for everybody that interacts with their brand. And so with that context, like what excites us about working in healthcare is that experiences people have with you all are packed with emotion. It's different. It's different in healthcare than going shopping on Amazon, right? Or buying an iPhone or something like that. Um, the, the stakes are higher. And with that difference and that emotion, it creates this opportunity to, to utilize the experiences that someone has with your brand um, to live the mission, right? To help people, um, to make people's lives, lives better. And living a mission of actually putting the customer first is, is a challenge across every organization, across every brand that we've had the opportunity to work with. Um, but within healthcare specifically, what we find is this need for this fundamental shift from um, a focus on metrics, a focus on measurement, to focusing more on the actions that people take, a lot of this, the things that Richard was describing. And uh, you know, so you, you need to think beyond just identifying a gap, you know, thinking about new surveys, um, searching for insights in, in reporting and, and hoping that the people that have the authority, right, to, to take an action, that they actually do that. And um, it's really defining customer focus as, as a business strategy. This is more than, being an experienced leader is more than a score. It's more than a metric. It's more than a target. Um, it's it's defining your your business strategy as customer focus and a means of uh, of generating revenue, a means of reducing costs. And to do that well, uh, it's creating a culture that that lives the mission, right? That has this daily operating cadence across the entire organization, where everybody knows what they can personally contribute to make um, the customers' lives better, people's lives better, right? And so experienced leaders do this by instituting consistent processes that enable action. 
So Fred Reichold, the creator of NPS, Rich mentioned him in his most recent book, Winning on Purpose, earlier. But the way that they, they would define it or Bain would define this is like inner loop and outer loop process. We like to think of it in the context of service recovery and problem prevention. So you need a, a scalable way to be able to categorize when people have a situation, an issue, that deems that you should reach out to them and try to help them, right? And you need to have a, a consistent process at which you're going to contact members that, to try to solve the issue, that you are alerting empowered people that have reasonable chances of solving those issues, and that they have a process at which they document what was done. Did they solve the issue? Did they not solve the issue, et cetera? And that service recovery process and other things should lead into a problem prevention process, a cadence at which um, people beyond the front line of the organization are defining and categorizing what are the biggest problems? What are, how are we going to prioritize investments based on the potential impacts that these solutions might have? Um, that we have a way of testing solutions and validating our expectations, that we have a way of taking those pilots or those model programs and scaling them across the business, right? So it's instituting this consistency and these types of scalable processes that helps customer focus organizations or helps create this member focus as a habit right beyond a score beyond a metric beyond a target as an actual habit that is ingrained into the operating rhythm of the company that's ingrained into the culture of the company and doing that is what leads uh, people to start recognizing that it's it's doing these lots of things you know a thousand things one percent better every day instead of trying to focus on doing one thing a thousand percent better right, that leads to real measurable outcomes. Let me stop here and just kind of get your reaction, Nate or Rex or anybody um, to, you know, that content before I start getting into some more specifics on tactics. Um, I, I have a couple of thoughts. I would love to hear from some folks. Please don't be scared to come off mute and, and say what you're thinking. Um, I, I think one of the one of the hardest things um, to think about is that scaling question, I think on your prior slide, um, how how to turn pilots and root causes into uh, a truly scaled set of actions um, that are ingrained, like you said, within the operating cadence of the business. Um, and, you know, that that is a real challenge, I think, that um, certainly everybody on the call, we're not minimizing that. We understand like how hard that is to do, um, to move from that state of surveying to orchestration. Um, but, but I do think this in particular is helpful to, to think about, you know, we all do the root cause analysis. And so we, um, to varying degrees, understand some of the pain points that our members are facing. Um, and there are very clear time pressures for for stars right in terms of how how much runway we've got to fix that um, but thinking about coming up with the power of those small incremental gains day over day and making sure that you have the systems and the people that are there uh, driving that again not from a punitive perspective but from a sort of goal driven improvement perspective i think is is a helpful at least mental framework even if we've got got some constraints that we're operating under. Right. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, measurement alone, right, isn't going to fix anything, of course. Um, there has to be a focus on empowering individuals up and down the organization with the information that they need to actually do something that makes something better, right? And this is a we find ourselves in this conversation a lot where it's people begin focusing on like just a new way of measuring something and that and that 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 is going to be the way that we're going to fix this particular member experience measure right we're going to we're going to do this additional measurement as opposed to thinking um, equally or maybe more about 
how do we get the information into the hands of the people that have the authority to actually drive the change that is required to improve these things that we're already measuring, right? Um, I think that's a good segue into where people start, which is with surveys, right? And solicitation. And um, most, most organizations start with developing a sample strategy, creating a, a way to measure the statistical significance of what a smaller group of customers have to say. And this is the rule book, right? That we are all living in um, as it relates to, to CAPS. A small sample of your population will get a CAPS survey and you cannot control who receives those surveys uh, or really see all the potential negative experiences um, based on the sample strategy, right? And um, so from our perspective, we look at this and the, at the, this quote, right? It's like, you can't, you can't sample your way to your perception <laughs> of, of what um, customer, I'm picking on one particular company here, but you can't sample your way into aligning, you know, the perception of what um, you think members are, are experiencing with your brand versus what they're gonna say, right? can't sample your way to improvement either. And uh, you also can't control where a member is on their journey or what type of channel they might have interacted with most, most recently um, when they get the CAP survey, right? It's, it's random um, and um, that's part of the design. And so because of these challenges, we try to encourage those we work with to think about solicitation and a, and a mature solicitation strategy uh, for feedback as being more than a mock cap survey, right? More than utilizing a different sample strategy at a different time of the year or something like that, but living by the same flawed process that I was just describing. And so done well, your solicitation strategy should provide a continuous pulse something that people can react to on a daily basis or a weekly basis. It should be listening to what members have to say across their entire journey, spanning all channels that they interact with your brand. And so um, one of the things that, um, that I would encourage the audience maybe is to think about even like the, the journey, right? Or the, the channel, I'll start with the channel. You know, how, how would you rank your solicitation strategy? Do you have a way to understand how members are interacting with your brand in these channels? And if you do, if the answer is yes, I feel like I have a good way of doing that. Is there, is there an easy way for you to connect all of those dots together and make decisions about where you should prioritize your utiles of energy, your time, the, the resources that you have to try to drive improvement in a particular channel? Right. And and the same thing uh, in terms of the member journey and everybody, you know, has journey maps and you, you all, everybody on this call probably has a different representation of what you would consider your member journey to be. Um, but just like evaluating how you're doing from a channel perspective, evaluate how you're doing from a, you know, a journey perspective and the, the moments that matter. And um, we like to try to remind people that that doesn't mean asking 30 questions or 50 questions or something like that um, you know in one survey covering multiple steps of the journey that that isn't the way that the best in class experience management companies approach soliciting feedback across the omni-channel uh, experience across all moments of the journey um, so what we try to encourage people to do is to categorize their solicitation strategy and, and think about the, the things that you're, you're gonna be tying the scores that you're capturing as parts of these surveys to the, the outcomes that you're trying to drive. And in this case, of course, it's the member experience measures that are Im impacting your star ratings. And so some of those measures are more transactional in nature some of those measures are more relation, relationship or relational in nature. And so based off of that, that should inform the strategy. We have some thoughts uh, based off of the work that we do 
on like what is the top 10 uh, you know priorities for where you should be soliciting folks across the member journey and how we think about the things that you should be capturing as part of that solicitation and how those map to the caps questions and the member experience measures and all that stuff right to be able to get this continuous listening system in place facilitated by um, by surveys right so let me stop there and just kind of maybe i'll pick on rex if he's i don't know if he's still frozen on video here <laughs> um, Rex, are, what, what are your thoughts on what I just walked through and kind of what, what your experience has been thinking about survey design and solicitation as like the starting point and uh, what kind of reaction do you have? Yeah, I think, yeah, sorry, I, I know my Wi-Fi because you, you guys keep freezing every now and then, so I think it's my Wi-Fi today. But but um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, we're at a place in our industry where, where um we are trying to evolve past that right and, and i think a lot of plans are trying to figure that out the we we've historically just done the big random sample kind of mock survey and kind of based everything on that and um you know i think you're what you're saying resonates deeply with with probably all of us trying to figure out ways to um to expand that right and to cover the whole journey and to to not just tackle it in a couple of months out of the year um you know, and I, and I know there are, you know, um, lots of things we're juggling from budgetary perspectives and just timing and abrasion, trying to minimize abrasion with members. And um, yeah, but looking forward to, you know, kind of seeing how, you know, how, how do we get from there to to uh, to where we need to go? Yeah, I think the point around budgeting and timing and like when we I mean, I represent a technology company, and so that's I have that um, in the forefront of my mind and thinking about the cost and how hard it is to do surveys. It's actually much harder to do surveys than to observe um, what people are interacting uh, or the interactions people have with your brand. And especially in today's world with the, with the advancement of technology, the things that exist right now, is it's 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 actually more difficult to implement or stand up a a survey program, and if I look at a a post call survey program as an example across industry, this is like a blanket statement, but you know best in class post call survey programs are somewhere around the neighborhood of twenty percent response rate, and that means that eighty percent of the people that interact with your brand in a call a call center experience you're not you're not measuring that information right and it's even worse when you think about a digital channel digital surveys and, and things like that so um the fact is, is and that's really what we're talking about right here is if you look at like the customer service member experience measure and one of the caps questions it has to do with issue resolution right um and if if you're measuring did people get their issues resolved with a post call survey um, or a post visit? Like, did you um, did you accomplish your task survey? Well, the reality is, is that there's a huge amount of people that, you know, that you're not measuring. Right. Whereas if you're using more modern approaches to technology, which actually are easier to implement and stand up than survey programs, then you get way more coverage. Right. Um, and the same is true, whether it's, you know, being able to do session recording. So you're actually watching um, and, and all the technologies in place to be able to control and, and manage like PII and PHI and all that stuff. But you could actually watch what 100 percent of people do when they interact with your brand on your website or in an app. Right. Whether it's an authenticated or pre-authenticated experience. And the same is true when. Um, we think about um, calls or chats, right? We can, t technology exists for us to take that call, translate it into a uh, transcript, or transcribe it into a transcript, and calculate sentiment, calculate things based off of the conversation that people are having. And this isn't unique to Medallia. There's lots of technologies. Probably you all have some of these things in place, right, um, across the organization. But are you really tapping into this and using it and aligning it 
um, the way that you, you, you could use that data to these member experience measures, right? And designing not just the, um, the fact that we have this data in a, in a metric or a scorecard, but designing a way of taking this information that we have and disseminating it in, in a role-based personalized way to people so that they can actually action it, right? Um, Richard, I see you popped on the screen. You, you thinking yeah. about them? I, I, I was, and I think, you know, Tim, one of the points that you raised that is important to, to keep in mind is, you know, oftentimes when it when it is a health experience, there is an urgency and the ability to understand a challenge and the ability to move at the speed of need um, is essential. And, and you don't get that through a, a retroactive survey at some point. Um, the the ability to and Tim stated like last year Medallia processed 7.5 billion um, customer experiences and only about 20 of that was through survey right the vast majority 20 percent of that was through um, survey the vast majority of it were were signals that are detectable that is the knowable data. That, that I talked about earlier that we're sometimes missing. And if we are going to be patient centric, that that is a verb, right? And it does require us being able to move at that speed of need. Right. Yeah, and I think that we all, we all have an expectation as consumers that people know us, right? I mean, and that's really this next step is once you have this solicited and observed way of understanding and knowing about what a customer is, is doing in terms of the interaction with, the, with their brand, it's putting that stuff um, in a connected way so that you can better use it, right? And the way that we think about that is in the context of like a profile, right? A profile, a, a, think of like a Facebook news feed, of these are all the interactions that Tim or that Nate has had with this particular brand. It's the survey responses over time. It's the it's the open-ended comments that they've said, but it's also the calls, the times they've logged in, they've authenticated, you know, the session recordings, what they did when they were on the website, what they said in the call, what they said in the chat. Having all of that stuff packaged up for one member, right, an individual. And then there's also technology that exists to connect those dots across all members or groups of members, right? And if you think about the context of this member profile or this Facebook newsfeed or something like that, it's again, we expect, I don't know if when the last time you all have you know, contacted a call center or something like that, but it, it drives me nuts, like going through an IVR thing, typing in my account, number or saying my name and then I get on the phone with somebody and then I have to repeat that thing and then I have to explain what I was doing right I mean that like nobody wants to do that right um, you you expect brands to understand and so having a experience data management strategy right and leaning um, in with like this being something an outcome that you're trying to drive helps you connect the dots and this is very difficult especially in um, healthcare, where we have lots of IDs, lots of uh, member IDs, like a, a a unique member ID for me versus my family's ID, or a, you know, a, an ID that is associated with calls versus web experiences. But the fact is, is that technology exists that helps you connect these dots, right? Um, and that people expect this. Uh, they expect this from their brand, you to know them. Um, and connecting these dots helps you better understand things like, you know, what, why have scores gone down for an individual person? Why did scores go down for a group of people um, that had similar experiences? Or um, when you have to do the service recovery, right? Being able to have more empathy about what somebody actually experienced, right? Um, and think about this in the context, just as an example, um, the customer service category for MX measures, it talks about issue resolution. Imagine, you know, that um, you had a bad experience with a brand and you fill out a survey or something and, and nobody calls you, you know, you, nobody does anything about what you said, right? And then you get another, <laughs> another survey 
about that experience with the brand. Like, what are the chances are that you're going to have good things to say? And now think about the differences. You know, you had this interaction with the brand and you expressed your frustration on a call, didn't fill out a survey, but somebody picked up the phone and called you, you know, within a half an hour or something and had the context of the pain that you went through and was seeking to try to help you solve this thing, right? And now imagine getting this CAP survey, right? So like that, that's the difference, right? Um, that, that organizations, particularly like cons in the consumer space are really leaning in um, to this stuff. And the technology again exists, not just to understand what people have gone through, but actually predict frustration predict things like churn, the likelihood that they might churn based off of what happened, right? Um, and that's true, not just for an individual basis, but again, group group of people. And this is where this notion of journey analytics uh, comes into play, where you can measure things like looping behavior. Uh, what is the particular thing that's creating a lot of repeat callers, right? Or uh, what is the particular thing that's, that's driving to channel hopping? Right. So the, this is a place where we expect members to be able to to self-serve. And yet they're abandoning this digital channel and they're calling us a bunch of times at this very high clip. Right. So this this again, this technology exists. Um, you know, Medallia isn't the only one that has things like this. Um, and this is really meant to just inspire you and think about, you know, what again, what is great look like? Um, let me stop here before I go into the orchestrated piece and um, I don't know, get your reaction, Nate. Um, what do you think when you when you see this stuff? Just keep putting me on the spot. Um, so can you go back just like. I, I, I don't. Um, well, not this actually your your journey slide, so. We, we, the collective we, I'm looking at all the clients on the call, we talk about member journey maps a lot um, and, and they are helpful. Um, I hope you're all like taking this in, in terms of how do you create a journey map that um, is a map towards action as opposed to simply a map towards, um, I guess, root cause analysis, which is where I think a lot of us stop. Um, some of that happens because we identify the root cause and we actually just don't have the platforms or channels to go out and fix it. Some of it happens because we don't have the people to go out and fix it. Um, but I think just encouraging people um, even to like change the mindset about what a member journey is is actually for and meant to do, um, I think is is really, really valuable. Yeah, I think uh, just to double down on that, it's like, I would expect everybody sometime over the that's on this call sometime over the last three to five years, there's been a journey mapping exercise at your organization. And that is a point in time, right, which people, a group of people come together and they um, define what that is. Um, what what this is meant to do, the technology like this is is again, just like continuous listening is for you to establish like you know, different, what you would call different aspects of the journey, but be able to measure it ongoing, right? And measure what's, what, how people are navigating through those steps with the purpose of understanding where is the pain so that you can orchestrate, so that you can change that moment for members. Yeah. And example. Can, can I say one more thing? And you, if you're going to, cover this I, I was I'm thinking back to even the um, observing phase where I, I don't know if we paused but we talk about abrasion a lot um, in quality right um, folks don't want to put another survey out there rightly so um, because they're worried about member abrasion because they're taking surveys for for other reasons um, so I would invite folks on the call also to um, really look at what Tim is presenting here and in sort of interrogate your own internal processes for how you think about what's a new activity I'm going to put into place to impact the member experience. Um, and part one of the ways I think about that is if you're putting in channels that are sort of always passively observing the behavior and using that 
as the yardstick of what the experience is, as opposed to a backward looking self report of what the experience was, it kind of frees your brain a little bit and maybe your soul, who knows, <laughs> to think about um, something other than abrasion, right? And to not be so scared of that when we're thinking about how do we get more information to drive better action. Um, and again, I don't say that to trivialize the challenges that we face in getting to that point, um, but it is it is something that I would challenge everybody to, to think about. Yeah, and that's where... Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Tim. I, but yeah, that's that's where my head is too, is, you know, historically we're, we're all about a, a, a big mock survey. And that's the only way that we really, you know, have an understanding of what our member sentiment is outside of like grievances and complaints. And it's our only way to kind of predict in any way what our future CAP survey is going to tell us. And it's just not reliable, right? And it's abrasive. And, and um, to, to evolve into something like this where we are, you know, we're, we're missing 80% of the signal already or, or, or more, right, by, by just focusing on these solicitation surveys, solicited surveys. You know, we'll always need to do some surveys, right? Like, especially like a post-visit survey. And I think about you know, um, if we can do this, if we're inferring what the member sentiment is and not actually asking them what it is, but we're observing and inferring, it's not abrasive, right? Yeah, it's it, it tells us all the information that we need to know without having to go to the member and say, hey, you know, answer the survey for us. Um, there are some things in my mind, and I don't know if you'll get to this, but where, you know, we do typically, some of the reasons we have mock surveys, right, is to um, like this will accomplish a lot of that. But then there are things like we have provider incentive plans where we use mock surveys to kind of understand at the PCP level, you know, what customer satisfaction looks like. And we incent providers based on the results of that mock survey. That happens a lot of times. There are other ways to get around that, but that that happens more often than not. Um, so we, we will still need to be doing like post-visit surveys or some kind of mock survey, but this fills in so much of the gap around that and helps us have a, broader perspective right of what of what the sentiment really is yeah and that's a great example of when when i was presenting that maturity it's not like you graduate away necessarily from mm -hmm. from doing the solicited things because even in the context of like a, a post call survey right we we uh and and thinking about like the customer service uh, caps questions like one of the questions is talks about um, empathy right uh, or courtesy and respect excuse me and like we can infer that and we could calculate that actually based off of the tone of somebody's voice the presence or the absence of what somebody is saying right but in terms of like issue resolution as an example we could also like estimate based on the presence of absence of certain things people's tone but sometimes you know, when you ask somebody, did you get your issue resolved? Their perception of that is different than what they said you know, on the phone. So like, it's not to say that there is no place for surveying. In fact, you, you should, right? And, there, and it has a purpose. And particularly in the examples that you're saying, right? Where um, all you know as the healthcare payer is that somebody had a claim event right? And they saw this particular doctor. Um, the only, and you have, the government is actually, um, you know, making it your part of your responsibility to drive improvements on behalf of the, of the providers and the health systems. So that is the best way, right? Um, now it could be coupled with things that you can infer from, uh, from call recordings and things like that. But yes, having a post-visit survey is, is, I don't think it's something that you can get away with just based off of the healthcare value chain. Um, just going into this orchestrated piece, one thing that um, we spent a lot of time working with organizations um, talking about like sprint planning and talking about agile their agile methodology and things like that. And um, we also spend time, especially right now with the pandemic and the changes you know, that people have had, there's so much focus on trying to reduce calls, reduce call volume. And 
most people are trying to do that by instituting chat and um, self-service things in the digital channel. And what we find is that, you know, even with the best of intentions, you can't force somebody to use chat if they don't want to, of course, especially with the age group that we're dealing with, right? And so given that, given that there's always going to be times when people want to speak with somebody on the phone, what you can do in, or, in order to orchestrate, this is an example of orchestration, is just make it so easy for them to get on the phone with you um, that it delights them, right? And so an example of that is um, in the digital channel, most people you probably are familiar with like virtual hold. So I can, um, call an 800 number and rather than waiting on hold, which nobody wants to do, I can press a button to reserve my spot in line and you call me back when it's my turn, right? Um, and, and that is technology that, that exists and it has some levels of adoption. And I encourage anybody that's on this call, if you're not doing that, to, to do that because members expect that now. Um, but in addition to that, it should be omni-channel. If I'm interacting on the website or I'm in a chat, I should be able to schedule a call. It should be easy for me, right? To schedule a call based on a time that's convenient for me, right? And that's, and when I do that, I can provide additional information. Um, you know, you should be able to schedule if I can receive a call back now, or I can pick a time as I was saying. And when I pick a time, you should remind me, you should remind me that, you know, I've scheduled this time and you should, you know, give me a notice. Um, to get me ready mentally to start talking or find my bill or something like that, right? And so this is just an example of, a small example of orchestration um, and, and recognizing that you can't force people to engage with you the way that you want them to or the lower cost way. And so given that, how do you create a, a system that makes it easy for people to interact with you at, in their channel of choice, right? Um, another example of that is for orchestration is knowing what somebody did, knowing their intent, right? And then changing the interaction that they have with your brand based off of something they've showed you, right? And there's tech, again, there's technology that exists that enables this type of orchestration. An example of this would be if um, in a digital channel, I am um, searching different Medicare Advantage plans, and uh, and even before I'm authenticated, you don't know who I am, but there's like a web cookie. There's ways that we can identify somehow that that this is you, right? But you're demonstrating it intent. You're 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 searching for things on a plan. You're looking for a particular provider. Are they covered? You might be searching a particular prescription or something like that. And so these are things that you're showing uh, as a, a consumer. And based off of that knowledge that you have as the brand, you can actually change the website experience that they're having, right? Or if they type in a email address or something like that, you could actually put them into a campaign management tool and send them emails about the things that they were showing you interest about, right? Or you could text them if they type in their cell phone number, right? And so this idea of first, identity resolution and being able to understand who this person is and being able to pick up the breadcrumbs as they interact with your brand and connect the dots about this is Tim or this is Nate or this is Rex. And then based off of the knowledge of what somebody did, being able to actually change things when they call, right? Being able to have to, to uh, provide a next best action to the call center rep to um, to know what the person was doing on the website before they called, right? Again, technologies exist to be able to do that. Um, so again, just like I was, you know, kind of challenging you to think about what your coverage was from a solicitation strategy, um, I would say same thing of all the things that we just talked about. Like how, if you were to take a, a look at your experience management architecture, all the things that we've just talked about, how are you doing, right? Um, and and when, you're, when you're looking at that, kind of reflect back what we encourage you to, to think about is the opportunity again that exists, right? Um, and why um, this type of investment um, is, is 
you know, in our opinion, the best investment you can make. And it's the infinite game that we're all in, the ability for you to live your mission, right? To do the things that, that all, these or, all your organizations are talking about. And it's the finite game that you're in, right? Um, the government is incenting you to do the right thing and you can generate shareholder returns by doing the right thing, right? And so I, don't know, I hope um, between me and Rich's content, this was inspirational for you and that, um, you know, that we answered some questions or, or that this was thought for provoking, but I think we got about 15 minutes left and we're available to, to answer any questions that you all have. You're all on mute, so if you have a question or even a comment, <laughs> feel free to take yourself off of mute. I feel like you've heard enough from me already today. And I did drop the link to the film that I mentioned um, in the chat uh, to I, Daniel Blake, if you haven't seen it. I know there's a lot of football coming up over the weekend, but um, between games, depending on which coast you're on, um, or as the evening winds down, I think it's great. But if you do watch it, just as you're watching it, think about what what something sitting behind that but very present monitoring the experiences of everybody in the equation, the people that are delivering care, the patients, the caregivers, to understand what's actually happening, where it's breaking, and what we can do to fix it. It creates efficiencies in the system, and it creates humanity for the people when we can actually listen and act. So if you'll watch it with that lens, um, and the accents are really hard to so put on subtitles, unless you're used to that, uh, but it's, it's, it's a tremendous film. I haven't seen it yet, but just you know, hearing you talk about it and seeing your couple of slides on it, it makes me think about um, you know our our kind of evolving focus on health equity too in this yeah. in this space, and it makes me wonder about um, even when we're observing observing signals for members that have a lot of social risk factors, right, and insecurities, and like that might. Or I guess my question is, does that look different the way we observe those members, um, the signals that we capture, like from community based organizations? And Nate, I don't know if you have insights here, too, but just um, it's such a, such a huge focus for us and such an underserved population that's their voice has not been heard historically. How do we especially make sure we hear their voices, right? Yeah, it, it, we actually have a group here that I'm, I'm part of at Medallion. It's across industries that's called equitable listening. And you know, there's the there is a project that I also work on with, with the NHS. And they have they have a word over there. We don't have the English language. We'll have a bunch of them, but they don't have an American the English language. And the word is called scunnered. And scunnered refers to people who are just generationally and systematically worn out. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they're crushed and they've given up and they, they've kind of lost hope and they expect the bad things to happen. Well, we have that, too. We, we just we just don't have a great word for it like that. And so, yeah, are, are you listening to all people equally and equitably? Um, and not everybody, you know, we like to go home and think that everybody's like us. And that's why pivoting on the golden rule to um, treat people as they want to be treated requires understanding the digital divide. You know, Robert Wood Johnson has a fantastic tool where I can go in and I can type in my zip code and see what my life expectancy is. Mm -hmm. And I, I I live in Pennsylvania. I'm about 40 miles north of Philadelphia. And I can type in the zip code um, just 30 miles from me on the fringes of the city. And life expectancy drops precipitously. Um, and it is because of access and it's because of, of social norms. It's because of, of money. and it, But it's because of a lot of things. And it's mostly, I think, because of people being listened to and heard on their terms mm -hmm. and, and reacted to. And we we miss that when we're in our cocoons. And, and this gives us an opportunity. I sit inside the feedback on Medallia a lot. Um, you'll cry when you watch I, Daniel Blake. I, I rub my eyes a couple of times a day when I read feedback inside of life sciences around affordability and around struggles and around people giving up. Um, 
if it doesn't drive you to action, nothing will. But the, the and, and Tim mentioned it. You can look at, let me fix this one great big thing, right? 5,000%. There's a thousand things that need to be fixed by 1%. And that's where it starts to change for the customer, but also starts to change for your bottom line. Don't be shy and ask questions. Hey guys, yeah. when, when you're looking at signals today, those that are driven what, through what I'll call experiential data, right? I don't have to prompt the member or the consumer to, to give me data. I'm getting it through their natural use of our product. Is there gaps that you see in journeys that you still have to rely on the survey collection to get to? Yeah, I, I mean, I think as it relates to like the, the the experience with the pharmacy or the experience with the with a provider, right? The the actual care experience. There's only so much data that you as a as a payer can glean from that information, and many times it's not that timely, right? Um, so those are. Those are situations where I think um, solicitation in particular is uh, is helpful. But one example like on a orchestration that uh, that I didn't mention is like the knowledge that um, that somebody uh, and, and the way that you can use these things to drive improvements in care and outcomes is like knowing the type of doctor that somebody saw or knowing that somebody had an MRI on their hip or something like that. Um, again, it's, it's possible to use that information to try to influence the experiences that they're having with the healthcare system, right? Send them information about the importance of physical therapy, right? Try to get them, you know, um, to evaluate all their options and avoid like a hip replacement or some sort of surgery, right? So I don't know, to answer your question, question directly, definitely when it comes to things that you don't have a lot of visibility to as a payer within the healthcare you know, value chain, there are specific examples. I gave a few of them where solicitation makes sense because of the timeliness and the depth of the data that you have available to you. And that's a great question. And I put some things in the chat, but just to quickly pile on. Um, that the, the feedback that's emerging that says, gosh, I wish we knew more. Well, that becomes a question, right? Later on down the road, if, we, if it starts to emerge as a theme and, you know, the Medallia's intelligence will start to show you in a word cloud or otherwise what themes are emerging. And that becomes something that that we need to start to understand. And, and um, I look at feedback and exercise I do with our customers is I'll take pieces of feedback and we'll whiteboard on it and say, what questions are we being asked here? And what themes does this align to? Um, also, the technology will allow you when you start to see a theme um, where possible to re-engage that cohort of people and say, can we ask you more about this individually? And that becomes really, really powerful. You know, in, in pharma where I spend a lot of my time Adherence is a massive issue. People get a prescription and a small percentage of them fill it and a smaller percentage of them take it and even a smaller percentage ever take it again. And it's a trillion dollar problem. Um, and we don't always understand why. And it's not always price. It's, it's oftentimes it's logistical, clinical and personal. Um, but it's allowed us to get much closer to understanding why people in, in different um, parts of the world and in different neighborhoods in the country are behaving differently. Yeah, I, I think that's an awesome point, Rich, and I, I want to put a pin in that for everybody that these more sophisticated ways of observing and then orchestrating actually make it easier for you to solicit and then get the actual information you need. Um, I think it's kind of the crux of, of what everybody is saying. Um, and I think that's a really important important thing to think about in terms of like, the investment and what the actual return is on that um because we're just going to think about it as like what's the return for stars what's the return for retention but actually the efficiencies that you're gaining from the channels you're used to relying on by making them better um i, I don't think those can be understated
nine minutes. Any more questions? We could wax poetic probably for nine more minutes, maybe even 20 or 30. <laughs> What does everybody think of Richard's beard? <laughs> <laughs> it was a really long pandemic, and I didn't leave my house for. Uh, <laughs> oh. Did you ever? Did you ever braid it? I I I have um, before. It, it doesn't look good for me. At least <laughs> um, I ride a bike, so when I do, I have to tie it down because otherwise, it comes up in front of my face. <clears throat> I feel like after I said that, that could be a triggering question, but. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, I, I have no look, you know, I, it's it's right out there. I, I don't I don't mind questions about it at all. But I, I do, you know, I wonder for people here and, and you don't have to answer live, but um, if you do have some thoughts on it when you are accountable without authority, do you see how feedback can help you um, go into your organization and say, guys, do something about this. Do you see where that can be a superpower for you? And you can raise your hand or or chime in or in the chat or just think about it. It's up to you. I don't want to pressure anybody. Hey, on that on that note, Rich, um, you know, one thing we talk to <clears throat> health plans about is uh, you know, when they're when they're focused on the voice of the customer, right? Is sort of because one thing in STAR is we have in, in most organizations is an executive steering committee and it's, you know, the STARS program kind of reports up to that and on a monthly basis typically or more often sometimes. But um, and it's the executives from cross functionally right from across the organization. So it's a really important committee that we try to keep engaged and try to um, it's not just a report out, but really engage them, right? And so one of the things we talk about is the importance of like sharing the voice of the customer in those meetings. And almost like we've talked about like delivering like a care package every month to each of the executives that that is a voice of the member care package, like like a maybe it's a call recording and a you know in a, a recap of a grievance or something like that. I'm curious, you know, coming from other industries, the great work you guys have done. Do you do you have any thoughts on tactically what that could look like to be really effective for an organization. Yeah, I mean, in, in one of the large biotech customers that we work with, uh, their CEO is asked for it to scroll across his desktop like like a Bloomberg. He wants to see it uh -huh. all the time. Um, he has it on a monitor in his office. So we have a um, an app called Medallia Voices and, and we use it internally, um, but our customers use it and it's just you swipe and you see feedback. And what it allows is one, for you to get in touch with what's going on within different parts of the organization, but two, from an employee experience standpoint, if somebody solves something, right? Somebody goes into relentless resolution mindset and fixes something. There's probably somebody else in the organization dealing with that same problem. Yet now, And now we've found the brilliant way to deal with it. And other people don't have to go relearn that. That gets shared. And the employee experiences, you have to feel, right? And, and it was in that one slide on trust from, from the book on the four pillars of trust that, um, Employees need to feel it too. They need to feel that the work they're they're doing is doing good and helping people. It helps with retention. It helps with dedication. So so those are examples. Tim, you might have more. No, I I think you nailed it with um, the voices. Is a it's an app on on your phone that we built for the C level, the C suite basically, and it curates comments or or a parts of a transcript or something like that and it's just 10 it's like a 10 cards that they can swipe through every morning um, and it also is is we try to make it actionable for them to facilitate this this cultural aspect of making cx a habit so for example if it's a a post call survey and and a member because it's not always bad stuff right a member is like you know uh uh, Nate did this awesome job and he went above and beyond and he he called the you know the um, the specific doctor and kept me on the phone and all this stuff. Well, imagine having a CEO just being able to press one button 
and celebrate, you know, that behavior with the call center manager and that call center representative, right? And it's it's that kind of inspection of expectation and you know facilitating, making it easier for people to celebrate the all the great stuff that's going on in your organization. It's not always just the the you know the stick; it's the carrot too. Um, that really we've seen um, help drive the the cultural shift, the cultural change at organizations. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Those are great, yeah, thanks. Great, well, we've got three minutes left here. Um, this is our this is our last session for a while for the for the virtual conference. Um, Rex, I don't know if you want to say any any closing words. Yeah, just you know, um, we've uh, not done something this comprehensive before, so we were really excited to launch these four sessions. Hopefully, um, I mean, I know we had great engagement, so so thanks so much for participating. Hopefully, you saw value in them. Um, you know, we will look to do more of these in the future and and have great partners like medallia to you know experts from across the industry come and and, and share you know the, the great things they're doing and just the, the knowledge they have from not only our industry but from other, other industries so thanks to yeah rich and tim for today's session that was that was really good um much appreciated nate thanks for coordinating all that that was that was superb um yeah and just thanks everyone for participating and, and again we'll we'll we we're recording this we'll uh send out the recording um probably today or tomorrow when it's ready along with uh can we share copies of these decks uh Rich sure. and Tim? okay so we'll have pdfs of these we can share too we'll send those out um yeah any any last words anyone if not we'll go so thanks so much appreciate having happy thanksgiving everyone thank you happy thanksgiving great see you guys